Hey, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together we can make it happen. I'm Manda Scott, and I spent the first series of this podcast laying out the basic toolkit that we think is essential to making conscious evolution a possibility, which is the entire premise behind the Accidental Gods project. This podcast, the website, and the membership program that arises from it. Since then, we've been exploring the depths of that alive, inspiring intersection where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, science meets spirituality, and all of us come together to a place from which we can craft a vision of a future that is generative for the human and the more than human worlds. My guest this week is one of the superstars in this world of crafting a different future. Rob Hopkins was a co-founder of the Transition Network. He was fomenting change to a more flourishing world while the rest of us were still worrying about the ozone layer. He's written a host of books, including the groundbreaking From What Is to What If that we will talk about in the podcast. He holds two honorary doctorates, and in 2012, he was voted one of the Independent's top 100 environmentalists. He was on the observers list of Britain's 50 New Radicals. He is founder of the New Lion Brewery in Totnes in Devon, and he's director of the Totnes Community Development Society. When the world needs new ideas and ways to make them happen, Rob Hopkins is there at the vanguard. So people of the podcast, please welcome. Rob Hopkins. So, Rob Hopkins, on our second try at the other end of lockdown, or at the other end of first lockdown, uh, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast. Well, How is life down in Devon? Life in Devon is kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I sort of I almost feel like I'm emerging from lockdown as a, sort of a different person than I went in. It, it feels very strange, kind of a process. And um, Next week, I'm going away to France to go and do some talks and stuff, which was supposed to happen in April and May and was cancelled. And But actually, I'm sort of feeling like I've spent the last six months, the furthest I've been is Totnes. Actually, I went to Exeter once, and, and, and it was completely <laughs> sensorily overwhelming. So quite how going on Eurostar yeah. and all that's going to be, I have no idea. This is how our ancestors lived there, wasn't it? There were people in our village who, for whom going to Glasgow was a once-in-a-decade event when I was a kid growing up. Yes. And and the rest of the time they were within walking distance or maybe took a bus to the little town and that was it. I used to live in Italy when I was about in my early 20s and I lived in this village and we had this friend called Guido who was about 80, lovely, lovely man. He still ran his farm on his own. He had a cow and a horse. Uh, and I remember he had had one time an English backpacking uh, young woman had come to stay in his house for a while and helped on this farm called Linetta who he still talked about Lynetta all the time. And he once, and I don't think he'd ever been, maybe he'd been to Pisa once, you know, he'd hardly ever been. And I remember he said, ah, you're going to London. If you go to London, just ask for Lynetta. Everyone will know her. <laughs> it's like his mental picture of London as it was the same size as in six, village. Six houses and a, and a, and a goat. Cows. Yeah, Brilliant. exactly. Brilliant. That's so cool. Um yeah, so since we last spoke, you have started your own podcast, and the whole of From What Is to What If seems to me to have taken off as an internet phenomenon, the concept of creative thinking as a way to move us forward. So there may well be people listening to the podcast. Actually, I hope there are people listening to the podcast who haven't read your book yet, because that means that they will go out and buy it by the end of the podcast, and we will enlarge the general audience of the concept of creative imagination and what it can do to begin to shape the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible, that Charles Eisenstein speaks of. So before we move into the work that you've been doing recently, can we talk a little bit about the book From What Is to What If, How It Arose, and the wonder that is contained within it? Sure. Well, uh, it was a, a kind of a two-year project, really, that I did where um, I interviewed more than 100 people. I went to visit loads of really interesting places, uh, projects, 
And it came about because I kept reading people who I really admire and respect, like Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and George Monbiot and people, and they who all seem to be using this term it would, where they would say climate change is a failure of the imagination. It would kind of pop up and, and then disappear again. And I'd be left going, oh, uh, that was interesting. What do you mean by that? Why, why would we be having a failure of the imagination in, in 2020 at a time when we need to be at our most imaginative? And then I came across some research done in 2011 by a woman called Kyung Hee Kim in the US, a researcher who had looked at a whole load of data from something called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, which is the sort of gold standard creativity test, which had been done in the US on big samples of people going back to the 1960s. And the, the conclusion was that imagination and IQ had really risen together until the mid 90s and then IQ had kept rising and imagination kind of just like uh, sort of divergent thinking had started to decline yeah. and I thought well when this was published it made the front page of Newsweek it was a really big deal and it was like people it was a whole load of soul searching in the US about oh, what does this mean for economic growth what does this mean for Hollywood like to which I was like, I don't really care about those, but I do really care about what that means for the fact that we're trying to imagine an alternative to business as usual because business as usual is a suicide pact. Uh, and if we're stuck with our imagination, that's really, really serious. And actually, we were talking about lockdown before. For me, one of the one of the moments for me during lockdown that just nailed this thing of climate change as a failure of the imagination was the most surreal, I mean, you know, the last four years have given us lots of surreal Donald Trump moments. But the one where he was talking about how he was trying to dismiss the idea of making buildings more energy efficient, because everybody knows that the only way to make buildings more energy efficient is to fill in all their windows. So they have no windows. What? What? I, I'm, I'm thinking, hang, you're the you're the president of this country, and actually, really, so, and, I, and on social media and things, I encounter so many people who get into that thing of, well, a low-carbon future is basically living in a cave and eating rotten potatoes, isn't it? Yes. You know? And it's like, well, of course it's not. Of course it's not. And and the so the book, what I wanted to do, it kind of helped me really realize that a lot of what I've been doing for the last 10, 12 years in the transition movement and the writing and the talking I do is about longing and cultivating longing. The only way we're going to achieve a, 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 a zero carbon world is by creating such deep longing in people that it becomes inevitable that we create it. You know, I always say when, when Neil Armstrong went to the moon, it wasn't his idea. It wasn't JFK's idea. Mm. We had culturally been creating that longing to go there. Frank Sinatra sang us to the moon. Tintin went to the moon. Everybody went to the moon to the point where there was such a profound collective longing to go to the moon that it kind of became inevitable. And we did it within eight years from scratch. We got someone onto the moon. You know, and 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 it seems like we often focus on the how do we build the rocket bit, and not on the how do we create the longing bit, which is about uh, imagination. So the book is a kind of an exploration of what's the state of health of our collective imagination. How can we tell if the imagination's not doing that well? What could we do about that? What would it look like if we set out to intentionally rebuild the imagination? If we elected people who said our priority is to make this the most imaginative country in the world, what would you do? How would you do that? You would have to completely overhaul education and health service and politics and democracy and economics. And I find examples uh, of all of those things and of people who are putting imagination now at the heart of how they see their political future, how they want to reimagine things. And my favorite, one of my favorite stories in there that I only heard about two weeks before I had to submit the final manuscript. So I had a frenzied couple of weeks trying to find out more was the civic imagination office in Bologna, where the government in Bologna have created a not a civic engagement office or a civic participation office, but a civic imagination office and said, well, our, our intention is to boost the imaginative capacity of this city. And it's so replicable and so beautiful. So fundamentally, the book is a, is, is a kind of a, I think it's of it as a kind of extended love poem to those two words, what if, and their, their profound uh, power and Th that our need to reconnect to them at this particular time in our history. Brilliant. 
perfect because it does seem to me that the whole thing, the analogy of going to the moon, we could all imagine what we thought going to the moon was going to be like. And then what happened was we saw a way we could do it, or we believed the scientists who told us there was a way we could do it. And that what is lacking in the conversations that I hold out in the world, not with accidental God's people or people within our collective bubbles, but the general people who still read the mail and the telegraph and believe the BBC, is that they genuinely have no idea of what the alternative might look like, which is exactly what you're saying, this total failure. It's it's easier to imagine the complete extinction of everything that lives on Earth than it is to imagine an alternative to business as usual, which is a collective failure of the imagination. Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. It, it is terrifying. So lots of questions arising, but the first one is actually, I want to know what is happening with the Civic Imagination Office in Bologna, because you must have... It must be at least 18 months, possibly two years since you submitted. Yeah, well, I haven't checked back in with them. I think as far as I know, I, d- I don't know what a civic imagination office in lockdown looks like. But the the idea of it, I think, came about the that they always trace. I love, you know, projects always have their kind of founding story, don't they? And, and their, their founding story is all about a bench, that somebody who lived on a street wanted to paint the bench a different colour. And they approached the municipality and realised that in order to just get permission to paint one bench was going to take them nine months, and they had to get the permission of six different government departments. No. And they realised that this was just ridiculous. And it was at the same time as they were noting that there was a real decline in participation in elections, there was a real decline in in, in civic engagement generally. So they that they started this uh, idea of a civic imagination office by creating six kind of laboratories around the city. And the people who run them are completely immersed in that place. They said everybody has our phone numbers and they and they run visioning exercises and all kinds of different things like that to sort of imagining work. But the bit that me for me that stood out as the genius bit, because a lot of that other stuff has kind of been done before in different kinds of ways. The bit that I was like, oh my God, that's such an important part of this, was this idea of pacts. So we all get so used in our daily life to being being invited to be imaginative at work. Someone might put up a flip chart and say, hey, ideas, people, ideas. Or we go along to a consultation about a housing development and we know that everything we write on a piece of paper, they're going to go, they're just going to chuck it in the bin and build it as it was, you know. Mm. So our imagination has become bruised and used to disrespect and used to just being sidelined, marginalised and ignored. And what they do in Bologna is they run these processes and the ideas that emerge, they're particularly strong. The municipality will say, that's a great idea, that. Okay, let's make a pact. We can offer this, this and this. And you as a community or as a community organisation, you can offer that and that. Good. Okay, let's do it. Let's make a pact. And in the last five years in Bologna, they've made 500 pacts, which range from we're going to support you to make a garden on your street and make it much easier for you to do so, through to oh, okay, you want to start a school to train and support young people to become classical musicians? Well, you can have this empty office block and we'll support you to get in there and to turn it into that. And it comes because of the pacts. And it, and it, and this idea of pacts feels so respectful to me. How do we create a, a place where people are invited to be imaginative with with the chance that actually those those, are, those ideas might become a reality. So for me, that was my key takeaway from Bologna was pact. The imagination needs pacts. Yes, and the chance that the ideas might become a reality. That feels like a really, really important key step before we ever start the process, knowing that the ideas that we have Exactly as you said, if you sit in the room and you create all the ideas and you know that the people running the process have no intention of following what you're saying, then it's already dampening, if not completely annihilating, the ability of your imagination to stretch out to its furthest limits. If you know that your ideas might take off, then then it becomes exciting and real and juicy and and fun and inspiring. It's a completely different it's a completely different experience. Yes. 
I'm due to talk quite soon to Mark Lawrence, who set up the City Repair Project in Portland. Have you heard of that? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Because yeah. that, that feels like one of those extraordinary experiences of the imagination of, OK, this we need more collective space, so we're just going to paint this intersection and turn it into a park and see what happens. And what happens is that there are now 700 of those in Portland, which is just... Mind-blowing. Or there were, before Portland turned into a war zone. Um, <laughs> there might be more so, because of that. There might be more, but <laughs> yes, you never know. So that's happening in Bologna. And it seemed to me that when you were writing the book, you were talking particularly to the more progressive parties in the UK. And I'm wondering, since then, and particularly since lockdown, because lockdown seemed to me that a lot of us who want social and cultural and climate justice saw the potential of lockdown for change, that the what Molly Scott Cato calls the Boeing 747 of the business-as-usual fossil fuel economy was landing, and that potentially when it took off again, it could be something different. And we're not necessarily seeing that played out yet. But I am hoping that there are some pretty strong roots growing underneath of ways that it might play out. So I'm wondering, in your connections with politicians in the UK, are you seeing more imagination being exercised there? There is an exercise that I do whenever I do talks where I invite people to close their eyes and to imagine that uh, we are helped by the time machine I built during lockdown from plans I found (laughs) online. We're traveling forwards uh, 10 years in the future to a future where we had done everything we could possibly do. And it's not a utopia, but it is a world that has been profoundly transformed by us doing everything we could possibly do. And I've done this with 15 people in the room and 1,500 people in the hall uh, in Belgium. And uh, the things that always come out strongest when I do it, when we then kind of get people's feedback afterwards, is uh, the bird song was louder, the air smelt clearer, there were less cars, or no cars sometimes. Uh, there was a sh- stronger sense of shared collective purpose, and there was food growing all over the place. And and f- uh, and and we would do that exercise, and then you know people would leave and go out into the normal world and go, yeah, right, well that was that was nice, but like that's ever going to happen. And actually, we had that's what we've had for at least a couple of months. We could go outside, and all of a sudden, that was so much more kind of uh, tangible. And and what I have what I've observed during lockdown has been a lot of organisations, a lot of extinction rebellion groups. Actually, it's quite interesting, and and other environmental groups who are really keen to explore that kind of what academics would call prefigurative, that sort of really feeling into and becoming better at articulating, well, what do we want to come next? What does it look like? What does it feel like? How do we communicate that to people? That we're going out into the world with a big, bold, beautiful yes that accompanies the big, bold, beautiful no uh, that is also so, so important in, in, in in the fight that we have at the moment. So I've seen a huge amount of that and a huge number of organizations, actually, who have been uh, picking up uh, bits of the book and wanting to do stuff with them. And and I've had lovely things of people sending me little video clips or bits where they've started a conference or started a meeting by reading the first bit out of the book, which is like a six or seven page kind of a, it's my imaginary walk through a future where we made it. And yes. uh, and that your manifesto. Yeah, it's been really fascinating to see where that pops up. So, I my intention always with the book was to to put it out and just see where it went. And so I know a few places now that are that are very moving along very strongly now. Hastings and Stroud and a few other places in creating civic imagination offices. Um, there's a th- project I've been asked to be part of in Northern Ireland as a coming together of unexpected organisations, and they're using what if uh, through all of this. Really interesting. So I, I'm just I'm just sort of sitting with all of that. It's really important, I think, that we always bear in mind with all of this that there is a, an element of imagination which is a function of privilege, and that the imagination needs certain conditions to be in place, yes. and that when we are living a world where we are overwhelmed with stress and anxiety and trauma, 
our the part of our brain that fires the imagination shrinks and w- one of the things that i was doing over lockdown was reading uh, adrienne marie brown who's a fantastic uh, black activist kind of permaculture activist in the us who talks beautifully about uh, about how uh colonization and systemic racism impacts the imagination she has this lovely line about we are living in someone else's imagination an imagination that doesn't make space for us or particularly want us even to be there uh so it's something when you were saying about politics you know we have to bear in mind that if we want to see a massive increase in imaginative capacity across society it's not a level playing field that if you don't if your basic needs on maslow's hierarchy of needs aren't being met it's very hard to have an imaginative life and capacity which is one of the reasons why on the, on the podcast we keep coming back to universal basic income all the time as such a vital piece of this sort of creating space for people to to rediscover uh, an imaginative life Yes. And I wonder, I had a conversation recently with someone who's quite tapped into the Tory party because I have been listening to other more economic podcasts with people who are greatly in support of UBI. And one individual had said that it was his opinion that we were now 50-50, the chances of UBI. And I, I said this to my friend who laughed and said, the Tories will never allow it because they need the fear to be prevalent, to maintain what they want. And and what you're saying is they, at a core level, whether they know what they're doing or not, they don't want us to be able to stretch our imaginations yeah. in the directions that they might go. They like the fact that everybody is terrified. There's a guy who I interviewed for the book called Henry Giroux, who is a, a, an activist um, educator in the US, who I read an article by him where he used this term, the, the Trump disimagination machine. It leapt out at me, this phrase, the Trump disimagination machine. You know, do we do we live in a time where where we are surrounded by, I, you know, I feel like there is a perfect storm of factors that we're living in at the moment that are corrosive and toxic to the imagination. We have no time. We have no space. And when we do have space, we fill it up with scrolling and scrolling and trying to get to the bottom of our Facebook feeds. And our attention span is being demolished and co-opted by people who value it financially, literally, far more than we value it. Uh, We have an education system that marginalizes it, sidelines it. Uh, You know, there are so many factors I set out in the book. And I do think there is a thing when you rewrite people's history for them, when you uh, deny people's experience, when Mm. people's attempts to change things get routinely squashed, when you have politicians who are utterly shameless and you and you lose that sort of sense of a familiar ground of if you do something if you break the law you're out of your job which applies to the rest of us we're kind of in this strange and and i think we always underestimate the 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 power that our time online has in terms of shaping our imagination and the degree to which now you know as we saw during brexit very smart, a handful of very smart people can shape people's imagination and sense of what's possible because they know so much about them through their data. I think that's a profoundly dangerous yes. uh, time and, and our imagination is in deep, deep danger. And actually, if we end up, I found during the research, you know, going back to people, going back to the 1960s who were warning about uh, what happens in a culture if our imagination gets depleted? What happens if we don't protect the imaginative capacity of a society and of a people? And and I think that's what we're seeing now. You know, that if 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 the the researcher Kyung Hee Kim was right, and we saw in the mid nineties was that was the point when we tipped and the imagination started to decline again. What she said was due to the decline of play in our culture and its disappearance from our children's lives was due to us spending more and more time on screens and less and less time outside and daydreaming and with an education system around that time that put testing at the heart of absolutely everything. You know, we we started to create the conditions then and we know that if we don't feed a society a good diet, if we aren't sufficiently nourished, then you see a rise in preventable illnesses. We know that if a population isn't educated uh, well, then it's unable to reach its full potential. But we seem to just be allowing 
this sort of uh, curling up at the edges, this sort of depletion of our contraction of our imagination just goes off just slightly out of our field of vision. And we don't notice it. And the point of the book with, for me was to say, whoa, 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 hang, 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 hang on. If we lose our collective imagination, we are screwed, particularly now uh, in the, where we would be at any time, but particularly with the climate emergency, which demands that we reimagine and rebuild everything. We have to focus back on this and say, this really re is something really precious here is not being paid attention to. And that really matters. So have you had feedback since the book was published from people who might hold the levers of the power to change our imagination. So I'm thinking, obviously not Cambridge Analytica, but the people who run any of the social media companies and or the BBC or Sky or Channel 4 or, or any of the big media companies whose job it is one way or another to curate what reaches our imaginal pool. The, the, the quick answer to that is no. <laughs> and the, sure, the, the, the longer answer is, but I have been contacted by quite a few people who are uh, script writers who are looking to yes. write, um, who are fed up of writing endless dystopian stories and who want yes. to do stuff which is uh, looking to tell the other stories. Uh, I've been contacted by a lot of people working within the education system who want to change it. And and and, the, and it's been really fascinating. And, you know, it's one of those things where you never quite know. But there have been a, quite a few things I've listening, been listening to, and I'm thinking, they read the book. They read my book. Yes, yes. Particularly on radio. Yeah, the, where they were on the, the food programme on Radio 4. Yes, yes. A couple of yes. weeks ago. That was extraordinary. Did this phenomenal it? thing called uh, where the idea was that we were living now, in, set in 2030, and it was a Sitopia. It was based around food. And it was so totally uh, that first opening bit of the book, but I didn't get a credit, but that's okay. Uh, but that, that's the, kind of the, the power of ideas. And the only thing that I thought was slightly disappointing was was how posh everybody was. Do you know what I mean? There were not very many regional accents in now responsible for running the food system. Or even young accents, or even, or young... even suggestions of people who were not white. No, there accents. was definitely not very many of those, yeah. I need to find a link to that for the show notes. Yeah, no, I, I, so what I, but I thought that was beautiful how they did that and just those little kind of observations of stuff. And I also know that... Um, Anne Hidalgo, who is the mayor of Paris, who uh, who has been very enthusiastic about transition for a long time, uh, and she wrote an endorsement for the book. And when she began her campaign to run to be re-elected as the mayor of Paris, which she was uh, early in lockdown, um, she gave this phenomenal speech that I was like, oh my God, this is amazing, where she talked about Paris as a 15-minute city, where everything you need is within 15 minutes of your house. And she painted a picture of what it would be like. It was beautiful. There was a day in the life living in a 15-minute city. And you wake up and you get your bread from here. And everything you need is within 15-minute walk. You don't need a car because you can get to everything. And and that's the bit that I see more and more of. And I see more and more uh, people using what if uh, in all kinds of different places. But, you know, I, I think as well it's kind of – I'm not saying that's all happening because of the book. I think there's something which is – kind of of the moment that maybe the book captured rather than somehow it all being due back to that. Yeah, but I think you put the idea out there and it's beginning to run. So things I would like to look at, I'd like to look a bit about Amsterdam specifically because it is heading to be a donut city and I saw that you had looked at that on your podcast. Mm. So we could talk a little bit about your podcast and then I'd like to discuss Amsterdam and then we'll see where we go from there. So tell us about your podcast and particularly about the Amsterdam concept. So the podcast has been my kind of lockdown project. I was sitting there thinking, okay, what could I do? It'd be nice, it'd be nice to emerge from lockdown with something different from how I went into lockdown. You've been doing a lot of lino cuts as well. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of lino cuts as well, yeah. That is Which are very lovely. Well, yeah, thank you. That's been a bit of a discovery, yeah. But it's um I I wanted to do something that was kind of beginning the process of thinking about what the next book might be. 
so it's called From What If to What Next. The book was called From What Is to What If, and this is called From What If to What Next. The concept was that, that listeners and subscribers would send me in their what-if questions, the, the questions that are sitting with them in terms of the kind of future they long for, the kind of future they dream of. What, which what-if questions does that raise for them? And then I would find the two best people I could to help explore how we might move from what if to what next, how we might explore how that could become a, a living, breathing reality. And it's been such fun. It's been brilliant. And and really, and we start every episode with that exercise I mentioned before of saying, okay, we're traveling forward. It's 2030. If our, um, so for example, the first one, the first episode was what if birdsong drowned out the traffic? Huh. So we had Sam Lee uh, and uh, Maya Rose Craig, who's also known as Bird Girl, who is a young ornithologist. And um, we started out with, okay, travel forward, we're 10 years, it's 2030. We're now living in a world where birdsong drowns out the traffic. Take us on a walk around, describe it to us, explain it to us. And it's just so beautiful. So beautiful because what it does is it allows you into the imagination of those people, which is what gets them out of bed every morning to create that. And we don't do that often enough. You know, I, I remember I, one of the guys I interviewed for the book called Stuart Candy, who's a futurist, who said to me that one of his thoughts was every time there's an election, we should say that the people who are running for office should make a two or three minute film about what the world would be like 10 years in the future if we actually, yes. if all of their policies have been implemented. You know, let us inside that bit of your imagination. We want to, I, I want to know what that feels like and looks like. And so, so that part of it is just magic. And then we also do a bonus thing for people who subscribe called the Ministry of Imagination, where there is now a Ministry of Imagination, which has proved hugely catalytic in terms of uh, making the, the country and its politics more imaginative. And the guests are then anointed as ministers of the imagination and are invited to yes. come up with three policies that would hugely accelerate our move towards uh, whatever it is we're talking about and not to think there are any constraints or budget limits or whatever just some really big bold kind of uh, kind of ideas and as those have gone along the ministry itself has become a whole character who actually uh, the building itself is so imaginative that some days you turn up to go there and actually it's run away to join the circus or turned, it, <laughs> turned itself into a hill and you the whole interview is conducted lying on our backs looking at a meteor shower and is it in this building that you've been talking about ubi a lot or has that come up in other conversations there's a slightly more sober conversation uh, they, it comes up in both, actually, but it's often one of people's three policies. You know, how do, how are we going to do this? Well, we need to start with a UBI, obviously, because that's how we that that's how we free up people's space. You know. So, have you thought in depth about universal basic income? Because it was one of the things that we talked quite a lot about when I went to Schumacher, and I haven't had a chance on this podcast to have a proper conversation. Is it something that you've considered as other than a concept because i'd be really interested to unpick that a little bit well i'm i'm almost sort of more attracted to there's the idea of a, of universal basic assets actually because you oh, right. because you which is a, not even services uh or okay. yeah which is and i can't remember where that idea came from but it's in the book and uh which is you know the idea that people should have access to all of the assets, well, and services, I guess, that that, that are needed because income is just one little part of it. But we did have a we did have, do a podcast that was what if a universal basic income un unlocked uh, or sparked a revival of the imagination. And there was a guy on that called Phil Tier who wrote a book called The Coming Age of Imagination, all about how imagination gives people how a UBI gives people space to be more imaginative. And his example, he, he quite early we were doing it was quite early on in lockdown. And he was saying, well, just look at what people are doing. You know, that, that's just a little bit of space the lockdown has given people, for, you know, for all of its downsides and stuff. And a lot of people forced people to stop and to pause. And you saw people starting drawing again or starting lino cutting again, in my example, or in my case, or... Um, uh, you know, making daft videos of their family, doing complex dance routines or posing as famous portraits and, and all this, you know. Actually, just even that little bit of space, you saw this kind of, oh, oh, I've got some space now. And, you know, I wonder how many people, you know, wrote the novel they always dreamt of writing or, uh, uh, you know, so many people started gardening in a way they'd always dreamt of and talked about and never done. Yeah, yeah so it, it's something that would also give 
the artistic people in the world this, uh, some kind of stability. It's such a, such a terrifying life. A lot of people being art, being artists, you're so hand to mouth and precarious, and it would give them. Uh, the other guest who was on that episode talked about how it would give artists a security uh, that they don't have, uh, which would be hugely beneficial for the for the wider society to see that kind of explosion of creativity. But also that, that in that situation, the rest of us would then have a huge amount to learn from those people that artists would then be able to teach us how better to use our time and and you know how to be how to be creative and so on so yes because creativity and imagination are are two sides of the same coin and if we had the space and the i think something you said earlier about we need to feel safe in order to be able to be imaginative and one of the strange paradoxes of lockdown it seemed to me was people's incomes crashed but there was nothing to be done about it it wasn't as if you had to rush around going out trying to find another job because that wasn't possible. And so the odd paradox of being less fearful than we might otherwise have been in a circumstance where there really was, for some people, almost no income at all, struck me as very liberating, as well as showing up the huge holes in the structure that we have at the moment. Mm. So anyway, that's probably Absolutely. a whole different concept. <laughs> I would I would really like to have uh, to run a podcast on on the difference between universal basic income and universal basic services and how we could actually make them work. But mm. that's a separate conversation. So Amsterdam is looking forwards and wants to be the first donut city. It's one of the C40 cities, of which I gather there are now, in fact, 76 at the time of recording. <laughs> which is a rebrand. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But it's going to change every day, so they can't do it. But, the, you know, of activist green mayors who want their cities to be, as you said, with Paris, to be 15-minute cities, to be living cities, to be regenerative mm. cities mm. where the ecosystems thrive more than they did on the land on which the city was built before the city ever got there. Mm. And that these things are possible. And that all we need is, is as you said, the Bologna Pact. So you need the people at the top to go, if you can imagine it, we will help you make it happen. Mm. What matters to you? And that Amsterdam is really kicking off with this. So have you been to Amsterdam or have you been Zooming with people in Amsterdam or otherwise exploring it? As a model, well, I love Amsterdam, uh, and also as a massive Van Gogh nerd, it's a regular kind of pilgrimage site for me. Um, no, I, I didn't go there. I, it was it was during lockdown, so uh, so we did an episode speaking to Kate Rayworth and uh, Marika Van Dornick, who is the deputy mayor there. I think the thing the thing that I love, uh, and and uh, Kate and I have talked about this quite a lot, it, that is so exciting to me about donut economics. And where it crosses over so beautifully with imagination. And Rob Shorter, who was at Schumacher, mm. who uh, I worked with to create this sort of um, imagination sundial thing that, that has been, a lot of people have found really useful as well. And he now works on the donut economics. Yeah. Uh, I've recorded a podcast with him. Okay, fabulous, fabulous. So he's he's a, he's wonderful. And um, one of the things that that, that came to me halfway through researching the book was the degree to which the imagination needs limits. And if I, so if I said, Manda, tell me a story, I mean, it'd be easy for you because you're, because this is what you do. But for a lot of people, if you say, tell me a story, you'd be like, oh, uh, mm, yeah, okay. If I said, you know, tell me a story about the mouse that lives under the piano in the pub around the corner from you who always wears a blue hat. Uh, you'd be like, oh, okay. So, and, you know, you, you, there would be some limits, a framework around the imagination. It's why Dr. Seuss wrote a book with 50 words. It's why we like haikus and limericks and hip hop and uh, art forms that give us some kind of a, a, a limit. And it's why uh, everywhere I go around Europe where people are working on climate change solutions who fundamentally understand the scale and the gravity of the issue, what they're coming up with is brilliantly imaginative and we could do that and we could do that. And people like Donald Trump who still can't get his head around the fact that a well-insulated building could actually have windows. windows. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like when, when you put those limits around, then the imagination thrives. And what the donut economics model does so beautifully is it defines that donut says so you can't go further out that way and you can't go further in this way. So this is the sweet spot. 
And what it does and what you see it doing in Amsterdam is then it fires all that imagination about, okay, so we need to be, we need to be working within this space. Uh, and that's what I love about it. It's, it's like a, it's, it's a kind of an imagination workout for economists, but it's designed in such a way that it's, you know, I've, I've been to workshops that, that Kate has run with a real mix of people, very hard-headed business people, uh, kind of artistic people, uh, engineers, planners, and they all get it. And they all go, ah, okay, that's the space, right? So what are we, and everybody has something to bring differently to what it would look like in that space. And when we did the podcast about it, they both did their kind of uh, walk through the city of the future. And Kate was so great at picking out all the sort of, yeah, and look over there, there's someone who's got a cargo bike and they're, and they're actually running a business out of the bike. And it's like this, you see this flourishing of micro enterprises and creativity and how it all ties in with a sort of a circular and a micro circular economy within that city. It's It's a really powerful tool, I think, for for shifting us into the headspace of designing within the framework we need to design with, but saying, okay, we're going to define the space, but you know this place better than us. You know, we're not coming in to tell you what to do. We're just defining the space. And yeah, but you can't push further out that way and you can't push further in that way. Go. And, and it's magical. And, and you see in the workshops they run and how they do them, the way they bring in, making and art and uh, one of the things that we wanted to do with Kate because Kate was one of the very first people who read the final manuscript of the book because she wrote an endorsement and I sent her the draft and bless her she was she was going to New Zealand to do some work for the new New Zealand government and she read it the whole way and she arrived she sent me this message from New Zealand airport saying I just finished it I love it it's great and (laughs) and one of the one of the stories in the book is about an exercise that Transition Network uh, developed along with Encounters Arts called Transition Town Anywhere where you get 100 to 400 people together and you imagine you're stepping into the a future where we did a, had done everything we could possibly do and then you think about well what's my role in this future what am I doing you meet other people who share your interest and you together design a project you're going to do and then you literally build it out of cardboard and bamboo and string and sticky tape and pens and then you inhabit it and you trade in it and you celebrate in it and you grieve in it and you dance in it and this and it's to be among 300 adults totally lost in a play world that they've created is just amazing and Kate's first thought was we should do that and as a circular high street so you could do it as a high street and then afterwards then you could pan up and you could look down and you could say look it's a donut (laughs) which we haven't actually we haven't done it yet because it didn't quite feel like it worked that time but maybe sometime in the future you know that somehow just that thought captured for me that sense of yeah, you you the, the donut economics defines the space, and then you need to facilitate the imagination within that space. So I love it. It's and and Amsterdam as the first, but there are many other cities working on it now. Uh, it's it's a brilliant tool because everybody un- everybody understands donuts, and 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 hearing Kate explain, don't she can explain it in about two minutes, and you go, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I will put a link in the show notes. So for people who haven't got access to the show notes because you're listening to this on the move. The donut is a model of economics where the floor, the minimum that is allowable, is provides for all of the basic human needs of food, water, shelter, but also political representation, gender equity, pay gaps between the largest pay and the smallest pay being narrow, as narrow as we can get them. And then there's an upper ceiling of the planetary limits. And the point is to find an economic, political, social, environmental solution that provides for the needs of all of the people and communities within the defined space, within the means of the living planet. And it's beautiful and elegant and it works and it basically overturns every economic model that there has been (laughs) since the start of economics as a science. Um, If Kate doesn't get the economics Nobel Prize equivalent, it'll be because they're all too jealous that she did this <laughs> and they didn't <laughs> definitely yeah um absolutely so so yes i'll i'll find uh, a link to kate describing that and i'll put it in the show notes because if you're not aware of this then that's the other book that you'll want to read as a result of this podcast after you've finished yeah, reading they, robs they're good companions they definitely are they at either end of your bookshelf so 
As we're heading towards the end of our time, I know that you wrote at the beginning of your book a kind of manifesto for the future of how you saw it then. But since writing, you have listened to so many other people clearly designing their future of, okay, we got to 2030, this is what it looks like if we got everything right. Have you got an internal model that you could sketch for us just now of how your life is going to be in 2030 if, from the moment of this podcast forward, we got everything right? Well, hopefully I'm still here. Uh, So assuming that I am, for me, it it always, it's, it's a world that is that is much more localized and much more resilient. So I see it as a, as, as a future where I'm living in a place with very little in the way of cars and the air quality is so much better as a result and streets have been taken back and tarmac has come up and we now live in cities where what used to be really, really busy roads are now... Uh, small forests, emerging forests and food gardens and places for play and an economy which is much more about micro enterprises than big enterprises. I always like to dream when I go into a supermarket about what this place could be and how this space could be used more effectively and what else could be going on in here. So maybe there's a maybe there's a sawmill in there and a flour mill and maybe there's a um, all kinds of people making different things that are going on in there. It feels like a future that's much more practical. People are able to turn their hand to most things. Schools are maybe more like how I've never been to a kibbutz, but how I imagine kibbutzes were in the sort of 60s and 70s, you know, with uh, food being grown and people learning through doing yes. and using the using the, 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 the town, the city around them as a place where people go to learn. It's a future where uh, no more uh, people of colour are, are killed by the police, and that hasn't happened for seven or eight years. It's a place where money that would be invested into uh, criminal justice and uh, brutalising uh, particular communities now goes into enabling those communities to live lives of well-being and uh, with good housing and good food and good opportunities. And we've seen a massive increase in well-being and drops in crime as a result. Uh, We see addiction being treated as an illness, not as a crime. We see people being able to live lives in which they are able to be imaginative and creative and and that there is space in people's lives. People don't work anywhere near the kind of hours that people work today. So families are able to spend more time together. We see a lot of the strategies that we needed to do for climate change. Back in 2020, we looked at climate change and public health and mental health and economic regeneration as entirely separate fields. And by 2030, we recognise that there are they are entirely the same thing. We join them up. We're thinking more in terms of bioregions and connecting people to those. The food's fantastic. The beer is just exquisite. Uh, we uh, we are back in a time where we go to places because there are things that you can only taste there. There are particular beers that you have to come to Totnes to sample because you won't get them in any <laughs> supermarkets anywhere. They're only created available. Created in here. Rob's Brewery, people. They're created, just, well, just to, you know, just to mention, yep. Yep. the bird song would be so much louder and the insect life would be so much more visible. But we would, it was the thing that I noticed during lockdown in 2020 was that I, I, that I'm, I, whether the bird song was louder or whether I just had more time and space to listen to it, I felt like it was a spring of bird song louder than I ever heard in my life, uh, of the most beautiful weather, uh, the, most, the most beautiful spring of my whole life, I think, during lockdown. And I feel like as we slow down going into that future, we'll, we'll all be able to say that of a lot more years. Oh, that was the most beautiful winter of my life because I actually had the time and space to stop uh, and appreciate it. Um, yeah, I could go on for hours with this. I it's don't know. Gorgeous. Really well, well, <laughs> please feel free. It's, uh, because this is what we need. This is the visioning that we need because we can't get to the moon unless we know what the moon looks like and feels like. Yeah, it's a thing that I'm doing. So th- these bits in the podcast where people talk about the future, they're so beautiful and so heartfelt and poignant and kind of dreamy and 
And I'm just in a, I'm just doing a project at the moment where I've been editing little bits of them together and I'm working with an animator to kind of bring them to life oh, because, because, because that feels to me like, you know, and I'm sure there are always people who will say, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, but surely, you know, by 2030, we'll all be underwater and it'll all be just horrendous and awful. And it's like, yes, I'm not saying somehow magically because we decide to, to think differently that, 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 the impacts of climate change that we have already put into train will somehow magically disappear. Mm. But the point is that the worst scenarios that we read and the terrifying scenarios, scientists usually say, this is the scenario if we don't do anything. Yeah. But there is this one over here, yeah, which is admittedly it's looking pretty unlikely. But there is this scenario over here, which is the, hey, we pulled our finger out yeah. and did something phenomenally amazing in a short period of time because we decided that we could and we did. We created something so phenomenally extraordinary that the generations who came after us still tell great tales and sing great songs about those phenomenal people who did that work. And that's that's the bit that I'm still holding out for. And and that's the bit that will only happen if we can help people to imagine it and to dream it. And so anything that we can do, anything that I can do, you know, to to give people those kind of tastes of it, just feels so precious and important to me. Yes. Thank you. That is absolutely perfect. So people will be able to find this animation at some point on your website? Uh, yeah, so I'm on Twitter as Rob in Transition. Yeah. And, uh, and also I imagine that it'll probably be shared first with people who are subscribers <laughs> at yes, the course. podcast, which is yes. uh, patreon.com slash from what if to what next. I will link to all of those in the show notes. So as we wind to a close, if people listening wanted to do one thing other than reading your book, go out now that would substantially or significantly or even just a tiny bit make a difference to their world. What would you encourage them to do? To their, to their world or to their imagination? Either. Both. I imagine that if you can change your imagination, you can change your world. If you can change your world, you can change your imagination. That's a good idea. Someone should write a book about that. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's on my list, Um, but hey, someone got there first. (laughs) Um, The thing that I find uh, my favorite kind of practice is when I go out for a walk is to look up. When I'm walking near trees is to look up at the trees and to or even just lie on my back and look up at the canopy of trees and there is something about the canopy of trees particularly when they're lit when the sun's coming through them and it's different at different times of year that is just is like such a kind of a perspective shift and the patterns and the compositions and the colors and it's just one of the most beautiful and it and it always just takes me out of where I'm where I am at that moment, uh, and it just sort of grounds me in something, and and it reconnects me to just how exquisitely beautiful this world is that we are blessed to live in, and uh, and it sort of it just gives me a bit of space, and I find that then when I go back afterwards, somehow I'm more what it, maybe what it is 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 one of the things that I wrote put in the book about about awe it's about kind of little little everyday tastes of awe yes. and uh and the, the the science about how awe makes us more compassionate and more uh more generous and more pro-social is really fascinating and i think for me that thing of just looking up maybe there's something biologically as it's why we like going into cathedrals and when we look up we go oh Mm. there's something maybe that when we even tilt our head back i don't know some hormone kicks in or something (laughs) but for me there is something about looking up at the canopy of beautiful trees even if even if i'm in the middle of a city that just gives me a little dose of awe and just sends me off back into my life with my imagination just somehow a bit perked up brilliant That is a truly fantastic place to end. So, Rob Hopkins, thank you very much indeed for our second try on the podcast. (laughs) Thank you so much. So that's it for another week. Huge thanks to Rob for being Rob, for all that he does and is. He is one of the shining stars in the firmament of radical action. And I really do encourage you to read his book. I will link to all of his contacts in the show notes. And if you are ever going to subscribe to another podcast other than this one, then his would be the first one to start with.
We will be back next week with another conversation. And if you ever have ideas of people you'd like to hear on the podcast, do get in touch. I'm at manda at accidentalgods.life. In the meantime, thank you to Caro C for the music at the head and foot of the podcast and, as ever, for the sound production. Thanks to Faith Tillery for being the other half of the creative team that is Accidental Gods and for designing the website. If you want to visit us, we're at accidentalgods.life for the show notes, for all of the other podcasts, the visualizations and meditations and the resources, and access to the Accidental Gods membership program, which is designed to help you to connect to the more than human world in the ways Rob was describing, finding the ways that we can open ourselves in the moment to a world that is full of magic and wonder and that wants to connect with us. So if you know of anybody who would like to be part of the more flourishing world that our hearts know is possible, then please do send them the link. And in the meantime, that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you, and goodbye.